Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, because we work with teens, I have to ask, why write the stories of young people? Why show us the world through Abdul's eyes or Precious's eyes? Um, I think that's the most powerful viewpoint to enter into a character through the first person. In, in, and it's also the most challenging because obviously you're not looking at a young person. You're not looking at a boy. So for me as an artist, it's challenging just to get in there and to try this almost opposite perspective. And I know you've written before about um, trying to getting stuck in that first person and maybe even rewriting in the third person. Then right. Taking well, actually, what first. I what I actually do is often write like a, a traditional omniscient narrator in the third person, and then I will, and that that way I fill out the story, and then I'll go, and then I have the kind of confidence I've got the story. Then I'll go back and get that first person voice. So it really is the kind of the the intense work and the intense challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually find writing in the third person uh, easier because you're all powerful and also you you are able to use the full extent of your vocabulary. So uh, uh, Pre um, Abdul was uh, better educated than uh, Precious, but with Precious, boy, I had to stick with a very limited vocabulary and a, very, and a, and per a person who could not uh, envision a world beyond 125th Street. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So with Abdul, we have a kid who can read, who's traveled, who's, who's thinking about, you know, the big time, and you know, so, but uh, so you really, in that first person, you know, you have to really um, use a lot of devices to, uh, to expand your, uh, your reader's view of the character without, uh, without violating that pact you've made with the reader in terms of staying in the first person. Mm -hmm. And I know the style in the kid um, sometimes feels like more straightforward first person narrative, other times it's really immediate um, stream of consciousness almost about Abdul's head. Was that tough to make those sort of those gear sh shifts? Well, I thought it was part of um, trying to make a more a layered narrative and get more information in. So again, in, in PUSH we have a straightforward narrative that takes place within two years. This girl knows very little about her history and really has difficulty envisioning a future aside from what uh, her, her teachers and friends tell her. Uh, with, with Abdul, what we were dealing with, or in the kid, the novel itself, we are really dealing with uh, wanting to look at uh, the whole cycle of abuse and not to lay it on um, one person or entity to really go back into his history. And that becomes the, the um, you know, almost humorous, miss. Uh, Habersham type character of slavery days. And so to go there, I couldn't use a straightforward narrative. We had to have that stream. We had to have her, you know, she's, uh, I saw her as a borderline dementia type person, you know, just kind of creeping into Alzheimer's. But she has this story and it's, it's obsessive. With, it's obsessive. She's not connected to uh, the current reality except for here's this great grandson out of nowhere. And so she begins to almost chant the story over and over again. And it, it's like anything, you, you start to create the technique that you need to tell the story. So it was, I, I was telling a very different story. Um, I wanted to enter into um, mm -hmm. what we see in Precious is Girl Interrupted. You know, the abuse has basically interrupted her life and she will get to live again through education and her, her son. Uh, with, with Abdul, he's not, he's not really interrupted in that way. So he, he has a psychosexual development that is interrupted from the outside. But he keeps growing in a certain kind of way. He keeps exploring. He keeps reading. He, he, he goes to art galleries. You know, he's curious about, you know, Charlie Parker. Uh, so that couldn't be done in just, it ha we had to enter into his head because he ha he's, a, he's a thinker, he's a mover. Uh, and I, I did, I wanted to present, um, I didn't want to shortchange this character. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious about when you were writing Push, um, she just doesn't have that baseline of education, obviously. That's the main thrust of the book is her struggle and, and journey to literacy. Right. How are you able to write that journey so effectively? I mean, to begin with someone that is almost difficult to read because mm -hmm. her language and her vocabulary is so incomplete. I actually worked as a literacy teacher. You know? I also actually was a dancer, too, for Abdul's story. So, uh, so I actually worked as a uh, literacy teacher, uh, first, first as a volunteer at the library. You know, mm -hmm. So that was really important. Um, I think I think in Push, the library that I volunteered, I wrote that into the text. I'm pretty sure the 124th Street Library, and it was there that um, I uh, well, I actually started in in California as a volunteer 
but I was volunteering um, as a literacy teacher outside of the library system. And in New York, I started working with the, the library system. And from there, I uh, went into um, working for CUNY, uh, City University of New York Research Foundation, which taught literacy uh, at, um, in their continuing education program. So that was a big part of my life for years. And I, um, I actually thought that 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 was what I was going to do for the rest of my life because it was such a uh, satisfying and such a uh, gratifying part of my life. Uh, as you know, it's all been uh, defunded. The, uh, when Clinton decided to uh, end welfare as we know it, I'm talking about Bill Clinton, not Hillary, uh, a lot of those programs went the way of, of um, dust, you know? <laughs> so, so that was where I learned that, that world uh, of, of, of low literacy non-literacy and of um, people striving uh, for language. Mm -hmm. Now obviously your novels deal with some very intense issues and subject matters, many of which some adults think are appropriate for teens or for children. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to librarians who are struggling to keep these books on the shelves for young people to read? Mm -hmm. One of the things, and I'm going to talk about it later, uh, um, later today and through the course of the, the next few months so while I'm out talking about the kids. One of the things that really happened in uh, the recent things that we're seeing in with Penn State, with Jerry Sandusky and stuff, was that there was no language. There was no language for what he did. There was no language for uh, anal rape of a child. There was no language for, uh, you know, predatory pedophile. He said things like horsing around. <laughs> what is horsing around, you know? Uh, so with, without uh, language to clearly define what has happened to us, we are a disembodied people. And that could be African Americans, that could be Jews, that could be slavery, that could be children, whatever. So what the kid does is, is you, you read the kid and you know what happened to victim number one through ten with Jerry Sandusky. Uh, it's, it's no longer a mystery, it's no longer minimized. It's no longer seen as fondling or horsing around. It's no longer seen as a histronic uh, personality who loves children too much. It's seen, seen as a violent, soul-destroying crime. Um, I think if these type of things are happening to children, and they are, they deserve, and I'm ta uh, happening to young people, and they are, they deserve the language to articulate it. I mean, th that's, that, is, that is my stance. And at the same time, you know, there, we do have a really problematic uh, issue as authors, as educators. What is appropriate? Is, is the kid appropriate for every 14-year-old? No. You know what I mean? I would say no. Is it appropriate and necessary for some? I would say absolutely. Uh, 16 to 18, it's a must. It's a must. Uh, young adults, of course, they need this language to be able to identify what has happened to them and what could possibly happen to as they enter into the world and become mothers and teachers and, and you know, uh, uh, they need this, this language. So I'm not, you know, I'm not minimizing the traumatic, traumatic um, impact of, uh, of, of reality, you know what I mean, and, and in literature. Uh, and I'm not saying that it's for every child. I know as, a, my, as during my childhood, uh, we had, uh, because my parents were in the military, we had books in our house that detailed what had happened in the Holocaust. I read those. You know, I mean, they had the graphic pictures, uh, you know, that, that had happened. I knew uh, about the bombing of Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. Could every kid handle that? Maybe not. I mean, so. I never, I never came up with uh, that it was too much information that was the enemy. I always had the idea it was not enough information. It was not knowing what, what really happened. It was not knowing what really happened in slavery and how that still plays out with uh, Trayvon and George Zimmer, Zimmerman today. It's, it's uh, minimizing what has happened to African Americans in this country that has sometimes made us seem like we're complainers and. Uh, um, you know, and made us look like, uh, made us objects of ridicule as we talk about compensation for the injuries of the of the past. You know, what I mean, where that hasn't happened with other ethnic groups, but uh, because people don't know all of what has happened in slavery and how it still impacts 
uh, racism still impacts today, it's almost like we're whining. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, a, it's not uh, too much information, it's a lack of information. What do you think the literary landscape today is like for young African American and Latino readers who want to see authors and authentic characters telling their stories? Um, you know, I don't know. I think I had a greater connection when I was out there with, with Push because I was still dealing in a, a paper book world. I don't, I think a lot of uh, information is happening and uh, is happening online in a certain kind of way. There's a greater privacy uh, that, that is happening, a greater um, almost secrecy about what young people are, are doing, you know. Uh, and, and maybe that's necessary for them to have some sense of autonomy. So I don't know what, uh, I, I won't say that, I can't say that I know what a 13-year-old African-American girl wants in terms of her literature now. But do you think she has a wider variety of options now? Do you think African-American authors are getting more opportunities to, to share the spotlight today? I definitely think there's just been, over the years, an, an increasing amount of African-American work being published. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and, I mean, I, I can remember in 96 when um, uh, Drown was published by uh, Juno Diaz. It was one of the first books by a, a Dominican-American, you know. Uh, so now there's many. So I, I don't think that there's less stuff being published. Are they getting access to it? You know, the, the kid is is basically marketed as an adult book because of the content. Uh, does that, is that off-putting to the, to you, you know, to people who are involved in getting books to kids, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't, I don't know. So that's going to be something that I'm going to be finding out as I go out with, because with the paperback, and the paperback is always the book that is more accessible to all groups of people. So I'll find out, you know what I mean? Well, thank you so much for sure. taking the time. It was wonderful to meet you. Thank you.